All right, everyone, good evening and uh, welcome to our regular council meeting. We start by acknowledging that we're holding this meeting on the traditional territories of the Coast and Strait Salish people, specifically the Lekwungen speaking people, uh, known today as the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nations, that their connections to these lands continue to this day. And just want to make everybody aware we do live stream these uh, proceedings, so if you come up to speak, uh, you will be recorded and, uh, and available for rebroadcast later. So with that, we're just going to get straight to our agenda, and uh, we have a series of minutes. I'm probably just going to just put them all together if anybody has any changes or corrections, if you could just raise them at this time. Um, Mr. Braithwaite? Uh, I, I do, uh, well, I'll make a motion to approve all of the minutes. Okay, so moved. Second. And then if I could, I just have one correction. Sure. On February 25th, under public participation, I think the first speaker's last name was spelled incorrectly. I think it's S-I-R-O-I-S. -I -I Thanks. That's correct. All right. Or that modification. Uh, the only other addition I had was in the last set, the special committee of the whole, there was also um, one piece of discussion there. There was, there was captured there the general bylaw updates um, but there's also some discussion there about specific to Uplands bylaw updates, and I might just want to capture that as well on the special committee of the whole. Any other changes, additions? All right, I'll call the question then. All those in favor? Opposed? Not opposed? Uh, my remarks, uh, I'll keep these reasonably brief as always. I just want to say I had the pleasure of attending along with a number of other councillors the uh, official retirement event for uh, David Cockle, our uh, long-serving fire chief. Uh, it was a very well attended by uh, by fire chiefs and and protective services from across the region, and uh, really showed the respect that he's garnered, especially with his work in starting up the uh, Shakeout BC uh, program here in British Columbia. Um, I also had the uh, pleasure of attending the finale for the Wounded Warrior Run, which finished at the legislature buildings, um, and the transit bus lane funding announcements for the Island Highway. The, which is very big news for us uh, uh, in BC Transit land to see some of that, um, those bike lanes or bike lanes, bus lanes going into uh, out the uh, Island Highway. Um, just want to raise attention, there was two today, but there's another more on Tuesday and Wednesday this week. BC Transit is holding these open houses and feedback sessions for uh, changes to the Jubilee section, so all of Oak Bay and a few other areas. Um, so if you have any interest in any of the transit line changes, uh, it's worth going. There was two today, and there's there's more Tuesday and Wednesday this week. And uh, just a heads up, since people should, I don't like people getting surprised if I'm on the radio. Um, Joe Perkins is doing uh, lunch times with late mayors uh, last two weeks, so this Thursday I'll be on there with him. So if you want to get bored, come out and listen to, <laughs> to, the, uh, to that. Uh, that's it for my, my comments. Uh, we have a public participation period uh, at every meeting, and anybody's welcome to come forward and speak to council to address any issue related to Oak Bay. Um, your uh, procedures bylaws allows for a total of 20 minutes uh, and up to three minutes per speaker. So you're welcome to come forward uh, and speak. And I see we have lights. So I knew this was coming, but I didn't realize it had come. Uh, this is uh, an official timing system here. So. Uh, I'm going to guess, <coughs> pardon my, my voice, uh, the green light is two minutes, when it goes to yellow, it's one minute or 30 seconds? Your Worship, it's 30 seconds. 30 seconds, and then uh, when it turns red, that's your time. <laughs> I know, this is fancy. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, it is, yes, we'll, we'll be. So, uh, yes, the procedure is we come forward. Please just write down your name so we have the correct spelling so we don't have to correct names in the minutes after the fact. And just uh, uh, say your name and, and the municipality. There, it should work now. Okay, welcome. Thank you. Um, thank you, Mayor and Council, for this opportunity to address you. Um, my name is Lisa Johnson, and my husband and I have been Oak Bay residents for more than 24 years and have been fortunate enough to raise our family here. I'm going to read what I have to say to be sure I don't miss any key points and to stick to my time limit, which is rapidly ticking away. Uh, um, as I'm sure you've heard by now, the uh, Victoria School District plans to build two 30 by 60 foot buildings on Willows Elementary School's Musgrave Field for childcare facilities and at a par parking lot, all of which they hope to open this September, doubling the number of detached buildings on this site as two portables were built there last summer. 
I want to be very clear that more childcare spaces are definitely needed in the Oak Bay area. However, as the saying goes, it's all about location, location, location. And Willow Schools Musgrave Field is the wrong location for these new buildings. And here's why. These new buildings would leave less than half of Musgrave Field for students and community sports, essentially destroying the field and permanently removing green space from Oak Bay. Willows is the largest elementary school in the district and is bursting at the seams, meaning, among other things, students just get one gym class a week. Outdoor space, therefore, plays an important part in their active day. Traffic. The traffic around Willows is dangerous and chaotic during drop-off and pick-up times. Adding on-site childcare would escalate this terrible situation. Oak Bay Police and Fire have been concerned about this situation for some time. It's a big safety issue. A key issue to point out is that the child care spaces that the school district wants to build at Willow School cannot be reserved for Oak Bay parents. This is what school district facilities employees said at a January 24th meeting at the school, and it has since been confirmed. Where the municipality comes in, of course, is that Musgrave Field lands are owned by the municipality of Oak Bay. This means that building permits must be approved and variances granted. Now, we don't want to risk losing these child care spaces, and we don't have to, because there are really good alternative locations that are still really convenient for parents of Oak Bay. Number one is the former Uplands Elementary School on Henderson, now used by international students who do not use the very large surrounding fields. This location is also a bonus because parking already exists. We would like Oak Bay to encourage the school district to consider this site. Second alternative location is Richmond Elementary School. There is a chance this school may reopen, but there is an unused area in the back side of the school that would work very well for childcare spaces. I'll end by asking you if we really want to add traffic to an already congested area or destroy community green space by allowing the creation of what will essentially look like a trailer park at a neighborhood school. I don't think we as a community want this, and I hope you as a council agree. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. 20 seconds left. I know. Oh, it, <laughs> it tells you how much time is even better. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Modern technology is fantastic stuff. Uh, is there anybody else who wishes to come forward to address us? <clears throat> My name is Robert Jack, and I've lived in Oak Bay for 18 years. Um, I want to echo the comments from Lisa. I would agree with her that this that child care spaces are needed in Oak Bay, but it's absolutely the wrong location to put this two very large buildings actually in the Musgrave Field. In fact, it's not just the buildings, but it's a fenced in play area that, that has to be devoted to the preschool. So will be out of use for anybody in the community. And as far as I'm aware, this Musgrave Field is community property and should be used by the community. It's not exclusive to the school board. So I think it's a real, you know, I live right by the field. I see the kids playing in the field all the time. I, I see, in fact, the kids play on the Musgrave field more than they play on the Cadbury Bay field because it was a nice, beautiful field, $50,000 invested into it by the pack to level the field, make it a great playing field, irrigated, everything. And we're just destroying that field and destroying that property that, and green space that really should be used by the community and not just fenced off exclusively for the use of, of a preschool. Um, so yeah, and the safety issue is really big. The traffic there is very congested. Uh, I drive by it frequently in the morning and in the afternoon, and there is a lot of traffic, and there's a lot of kids walking along the sidewalks there, and cars are pulling in and out, and there's no point in increasing that when you have available spaces like Uplands and Richmond with ample parking. And actually, while I think of it, Willow School has over 60 staff, I think just about 60 or a little bit more, and they have 27 parking spaces. So it's, the parking is inadequate. In fact, this is going to cause more congestion and more problems with street parking. And I would suggest that the residents there must be pretty, will, will be, if they're currently annoyed, they'll be very annoyed by the time this project is finished. So, yeah, I would say that, that this is just, once again, preschool spaces, child mining spaces are fine, but not at this location. All right, thank you. Thank you. I saw you glancing down at the green light. And you're right. You don't have to go right to the very end. You don't have to <laughs> use that all the time. Uh, anybody's, uh, it gives more time for other people to speak. Is there anybody else who wishes to come forward and address council? I, I know this is largely a school district issue that, that they're, they're taking the feedback on the, on the pieces. I don't know if staff have any updates at this point to, to bring forward. 
Mr. Jones, if you, you don't have to. I mean, at, at the end of the day, yes, it's really the school district's process, but I'll, I'll let Ms. Uh, Ms. Adams, welcome. Thank you. Uh, my name is Barbara Adams, and I live at 230 King George Terrace. And uh, I'm uh, uh, at present Arts Laureate of Oak Bay. And I just wanted to clear up a couple of misconceptions that have been floating around. I'm, I really appreciate the input that's coming from the community. I think it's great. But uh, I just want to clear up a couple of issues. Uh, first of all, uh, so we we put together a fact sheet that answers some questions. Uh, how did the CELOR project come about? In in September 2017, uh, an Oak Bay resident contacted the then mayor Nils Jensen with the idea of donating a sculpture to Oak Bay that would bring a smile to the lips of passers-by and enrich the community. The mayor was intrigued, and he asked. Uh, myself and the PAAC to look at the feasibility of such a project. Is the Sea Lore part of the annual Arts Alive Sculpture Program? No, it is not. And uh, the Arts Alive Sculpture Program is was designed for public engagement and participation, is sponsored by local businesses, and uh, has been endorsed by council. CELOR is an unrelated sculpture donation for community consideration. How is the site chosen? The donor inspired by international sculptures, such as Copenhagen's Little Mer Mermaid, thought the single rock in the bay between Haynes Park and the marina would be appropriate for the sculpture. Has the site been approved? No. However, on June 11th, 2018, Council of the Time passed a resolution endorsing the idea of placing a sculpture on a rock in the bay. An application for a license to occupy the rock has been submitted to the provincial government, Department of Lands, Forest, Natural Resources, etc. Uh, our MLA, uh, Andrew Weaver, and MP Murray Rankin have shown support for this application. The license to occupy is, pe is pending final decision on siting uh, will rest with the council. Um, are alternative sites being considered? Other sites for the sculpture could be considered, although this particular sculpture was designed for the rock in the, lo in the bay location and may not be suitable. How is the sculpture Octavina chosen? The Public Art Advisory Committee aided the donor in choosing the sculpture on artistic merit, theme, appropriateness to the site, and technical feasibility. The committee used a call and jurying process used by other municipalities in choosing art. Who is paying the costs of the sculpture? The donor is covering all costs. Will the sculpture withstand the elements? Okay. Thank you for this list listening. Obviously, it's way too long. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Miss Adams. I was curious what would happen when I got to red, so now I know uh, uh, an evil beep comes forth. <laughs> uh, is there anybody else who wishes to come forward to address council at this time? Anybody else? Okay. Uh, I will then go back to Mr. Jones. You, you thought you had something to add to the conversation on the school land? Your Worship, just uh, in respect to uh, uh, the the possibility of uh, having portables at the Willows. Um, staff have been in contact with uh, representatives of the school district, and we've been advised that there will be more information posted on the school district website as to uh, how they uh, intend to uh, proceed with this process. So that's uh, people should uh, pay attention to the school district website. Okay, thank you. And as we get more information, I'm sure we can share it, but at this point, it really is still in their hands as to what they're going to be doing finally. So uh, I do appreciate you coming forward to this. It's been the last few meetings, we've had a number of people coming forward on the school district issue. So thank you for that. Uh, moving on to item number four, we have a presentation by the Greater Victoria Public Library. And uh, please come forward. Just the, you, don't, you don't get the timer. Do we get three minutes? No, no. no you get a... <laughs> You're allowed to speak longer if you wish. <laughs> no, uh, I, and the I process here is we'll, uh, we'll, you have a presentation to make and then we'll take questions 
uh, uh, from Council. And if you, uh, Ms. McGuire, if you don't mind introducing who you have with you as well at the same time. Yes, yeah, I certainly will. Um, thank you very much. So good evening, Mayor Murdoch, Council members and staff. Thank you for inviting us to present our 2019 final budget. My name is Deborah Vigori, and I am chair of the Greater Victoria Public Library Board and a citizen representative for the city of Victoria. With me to present today is our CEO, Maureen Sawa, and our director of finance and facilities, Paul McKinnon. I'd also like to recognize Councillor Andrew Appleton, who is your council representative on the Greater Victoria Public Library Board. And of course, I have to recognize you, Your Worship, uh, Mayor Kevin Murdoch, who serves so ably not only as a Oak Bay Councillor member, but also as Vice Chair and then Chair of the Library Board. So thank you. The commitment of our Board Councillor representatives to represent their constituents across the GVPL's 10 munici member municipalities is significant. And as a citizen representative, I certainly am impressed by them and grateful for their insights and perspectives. Now more than ever, public libraries are essential partners in building smart, sustainable and successful communities. Through the power of partnerships, the Greater Victoria Public Library is a place where doors and minds are always open. You've received our final budget package. The library staff and the board have worked hard to develop a budget for 2019 that is realistic and resourceful. So on behalf of the board and the staff and the community that we all serve, I would like to express my thanks to your council for your continued support for the role that public libraries play in building strong and vibrant communities. And now I will turn things over to Maureen for the remainder of this presentation. And Maureen, Paul and I look forward to responding to any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Begori. Welcome, Ms. Sawa. Thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be back again. Um, as uh, our board chair has pointed out, uh, we are um, part of a 12 um, branch system now. As you know, um, the Greater Victoria Public Library system is a shared service model funded by all 10 municipalities. This enables the library to provide all of our member municipalities with a standard of service serving um, 327,000 plus residents that would not be possible for any one single municipality to offer individually. So we truly are, um, um, you know, uh, an example of the whole being greater than the sum of its parts. So just kind of a reminder of, of the location of our branches. As you can see from our latest statistics, and I just did something stupid. Okay. Um, okay. Can I? Sorry. <laughs> This was supposed to go so smoothly. Okay, I will just talk about our latest statistics. Um, GVPL's usage numbers are impressive. Our total circulation in 2018, both physical and digital, was nearly 6 million items. We are definitely a community that loves to read and to learn. The contribution that public libraries make to local communities such as Oak Bay is truly significant. Just wanted to share with you some highlights of our um, 2018 business plan. We continued to rank as the one of the highest per capita circulating library systems in the country. Um, we tend to come out as number one, uh, and that means that in terms of per capita usage, um, we are a very heavily uh, used system. We helped to bridge the digital divide with more than 170 technology programs, including Google Translate, cybersecurity programs, and online investment. It did over 500 outreach programs and events took place throughout our service area and a phenomenal number um, of children took part in the BC Summer Reading Club, close to 9,000 children, which was a 5.4% increase from 2017. And of course, we opened our new branch in James Bay in Victoria. We received the results of an important third party research um, that was conducted in 2018. Adult residents in our service area were asked to share their perceptions of the Greater Victoria Public Library. And as you can see from some of the highlights that I've got up on the screen, there is an overwhelming support for the mandate and the role that the library plays in Greater Victoria. The library truly provides a good return on investment for local taxpayers. And now I'd like to quickly share with you highlights of our four um, library strategic priorities for our strategic plan and some impacts in terms of Oak Bay. First of all, creating great library spaces to meet unique user needs. 
We have an art wall featuring the work of local artists at the Oak Bay branch. And you may know we've uh, recently improved our service area so that we have a new integrated service desk that provides one-stop service at the Oak Bay branch. The impact of the library, though, goes well beyond the bricks and the mortars to reach people where they are in person and online. We even take stories outside with inspiring initiatives such as family story walks, which is what that picture is showing you where children enjoy stories in the great outdoors. The Oak Bay branch is one of the busiest branches in the system, from well-used spaces to in-demand public computers. It enjoys the third highest circulation rate of physical materials in the Greater Victoria Public Library System and the second highest number of in-person visits um, were recorded in 2018. The branch is well equipped to provide opportunities for the, com the community to come in and build skills from emergency preparedness and teen Toastmasters to preschool STEAM discovery labs and one-on-one -on -one sessions that help bridge the digital divide. We inspire discovery through programs, collections, and services that enhance literacy and lifelong learning. From the 4,418 children and parents at our family and baby story times to providing a window on world events throughout our collection, the Oak Bay branch offered something for everyone in 2018. In addition to the various programs, um, children keep coming back to explore the collection and services we provide all year long. 1,338 children participated in the British Columbia Summer Reading Club at Oak Bay, 42.2% of whom completed the seven weeks of daily reading. This is the highest registration and completion rate in the entire system, and that really says something. Those of you who have ever enjoyed the reading club uh, with children or grandchildren know it's always very exciting to start that program, but to finish it, that takes real commitment. <laughs> and you have a committed group of children in Oak Bay. We engage passionate library members, funders, and partners, expanding the library's reach and impact through collaborative programming. Our new Culture Pass partnership with Victoria Butterfly Gardens, as shown above, further supports lifelong learning in Oak Bay. We, we work with so many of your local schools, from Willows Elementary, Margaret Jenkins Elementary, the list goes on, and a number of successful community events, such as pop-up libraries, including um, libraries at the Night Market, the Oak Bay Tea Party, Halloween on the Avenue, and many, many more. We're very proud of the level of engagement in Oak Bay. We couldn't resist the next picture. I'm sorry, we just had to when we talk about leadership. Um, so leadership is something that the library really believes in. Um, this was a picture from our um, introduction of our strategic plan, but we are recognized as a system leader across Canada, and we've been invited to present on everything from community-inspired library service to our innovative new uh, librarian development program. So to get into the budget situation, um, there are three primary budget drivers for us in 2019. The first, of course, is negotiated salaries and benefits. Staff are our most important resource. The second one, and I come to this um, lately, it seems like every year I have to comment on reduced fines and fees revenue, um, as we like to think, and we do, uh, provide excellent customer service. So you get excellent reminders that your materials are due, which means people do return their materials on time. Hence, we don't collect as many fines. Um, the other thing that's happening more and more is the proliferation of uh, usage of our e-resources. And again, the, the beauty of using um, digital resources is you don't have to return them because they self-return. And I sometimes refer to that as, you know, in the middle of reading the book, it just kind of disappears. Again, no overdue fee on that. So we are looking at our fines and fees. Um, but the other thing I wanted just to mention is building occupancy costs, because that has been quite um, quite a driver this year. Um, they continue to rise. Um, labor costs, things like minimum wage for contracted work, um, environmental legislation and standards, increased costs of janitorial service, market rates, the wear and tear of our facilities because of the increased traffic. These are unavoidable costs that go in hand in hand with improved services. We are just so well used. However, we do have some budget savers thanks to the innovation of our staff. 
I think you're all familiar with the concept of floating collections. This has been a terrific asset for um, such a shared system as Greater Victoria Public Library. What it means is the convenience for our patrons in that if you were to borrow a book um, from the Oak Bay branch and then happen to be downtown for a meeting and wanted to return it at the Central Library, you could. What that means, though, is instead of the book being brought back to the Oak Bay branch, it would then become um, shelved at the Central Library. And this goes on through all 12 of our branches. What that means is in addition to our collection development budgets, we are able to constantly refresh our collections. So no one branch collection ever gets kind of stale because it's being kind of constantly refreshed as a benefit of being part of such a large system. So that's one example of what we do to kind of stretch our dollars in an innovative way. There's also been a number of IT um, developments, new tools to manage all desktop computers and mobile devices in the network, which has saved a lot of time and effort of our staff and creates more capacity for new projects and priorities. Collaboration, as Deborah mentioned, we are just so um, focused on partnerships. We have over 100 active community partners, and I do like to say that GVPL does succeed in doing more with more. Not more budget dollars, but more partnerships so that we're able to provide um, increased services. And our, pop, our mobile pop-up libraries and outreach um, efforts are great examples of doing more with more. And then something that Paul can speak to with a little bit more detail is that we have had some one-time costs funded this year um, as, a, as a benefit of a prior year surplus. So hardware upgrades and replacements, a uh, very ambitious staff training program and other um, leadership developments uh, we've been able to cover with surplus and there was a one-year spike in the medical services plan MSP costs that we were able to absorb thanks to that so that that was very helpful. So in terms of the 2019 budget request um, as you have in your package our budget request is aligned with our strategic plan and this year we are requesting a 2.25 percent increase that's less than last year's which was a 2.90 percent increase overall We've worked very hard to keep this increase to a minimum. Um, the budget does support equitable access to services and programs, and it is essentially a status quo budget. So what that means for Oak Bay this year is a 2019 contribution um, taking into, uh, based on converted assessment values and population, including rental adjustments, is $1,188,789. Dollars. This is a 1.50% increase over last year, so less than the overall system increase, and that um, turns into a cost per capita increase of 96 cents. So um, we do want it, uh, just to mention our priorities for 2019. As you can see up in the screen, we are um, looking at uh, relocating um, the Esquimalt branch as part of their um, their village town project that won't actually happen until next year but we will be working on it this year we will be developing a new strategic plan um, we're piloting a new interactive early learning space at one of our branches that we hope to um, uh, spread to all of our branches and we are in the process of opening up our facilities master plan to be updated um, the library's master plan was um, first um, completed in 20 10 and a lot of things have changed since then so we're, we're quite focused on what we can do with that um, and of course as I mentioned fines and fees review this is a quote you know we get a lot of customer feedback but this one really resonated with us this year it's a thank you from a patron who's um, as she says nearly 82 years old um, she talks about her first visits to the old Carnegie Library when she was four or five and her introduction to um, the world of Indigenous studies, and she now um, has been working for 35 years um, with First Nations people at the Royal BC Museum in Ethnology and Archaeology. She says, where would I be today without the Greater Victoria Public Library? My entire life has been hugely enriched by the library and the dedicated librarians. 
The library has been the greatest influence in my life, and I am so grateful. We really believe that that is the case for so many people, not just in Oak Bay, but throughout the whole um, area that we serve, and we're very grateful for the support that municipalities provide so that we continue to make that kind of difference in people's lives. So that concludes our formal presentation, and Paul uh, is very happy to answer questions, as am I, about anything to do with either service or the budget numbers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Salva. Are there uh, questions? And I just want to acknowledge before we start that uh, the very able uh, job that Councillor Appleton is doing on the library board and the, and the work that goes in there. It's an important work uh, and certainly appreciate the, the hard work that you put in there. Um, are there questions of Ms. Salva? Oh, I'll... Councillor Zelka, Councillor Patterson, and Councillor... Thank you very much, uh, Chair, and uh, thank you so much for the wonderful presentation. Uh, I, I, I l absolutely love this resource in our community and throughout, the, throughout uh, uh, Victoria, and my children have benefited greatly. I'm, I, I will admit, my family in particular is uh, benefiting you on fees and, uh, <laughs> and late fees in particular. Uh, I guess that means I am, but uh, that's Thank fine. you. So you're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, uh, so, well, I, I, I don't begrudge anything uh, uh, in your report. Uh, it, it is, it, it is uh, uh, reasonable, for, I think, for me to ask. Um, I do note on uh, page six of the municipal, 2019 municipal per capita contributions, mm -hmm. that again, Oak Bay is on a per person basis contributing more uh, than anyone else in the CRD area. Um, and I know it's convoluted formulas. I've uh, had a chance to, to work through it before in previous years, and I have to ask again. Um, uh, uh, with uh, the relatively low rates, it looks like it goes from a low of $49 to, uh, to our high, which is $63.77 per person. Um, if you could maybe just give an indication as to if we'll ever fix that formula. Because I presume if we started a, a, a library today, we would all be paying the same, I, I assume. I hmm, it's a good question. I simply, I simply <laughs> the formula, had to ask yeah, the, form, the formula the formula is come up. It, it comes up at other municipalities. You're not the only one, um, and and some years it's kind of in municipalities' favor, and other years it's not. But it does truly even out. And I will ask Paul to kind of maybe speak to the specifics sure. of that. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Sure. Thank you, Maureen. Uh, good question. The, the easiest way I used to describe this one quite often is if we had a zero budget increase, um, your proportion of requisition could change year over year just based on the relative position within the rest of the municipalities. Oak Bay is, is blessed with with high assessment values, good or bad. Uh, that unfortunately does sway in terms of the per capita cost relative to the rest of the region, and that's why you see that here. Um, again, that, uh, as Maureen points out, it, it really is the luck of the draw or luck of BC assessment, really, because uh, we look at 50% of the ratio comes from BC assessment tax values and 50% from population. So if you have an area where the population growth is relatively stable versus the assessment values, uh, if you recall last year, Oak Bay was just over 10%, I believe, uh, was the increased value, whereas this year we're at 1.5, and, and again, that's relative to the rest of the regions. Going back to the question around the uh, the formula within the Library Operating Act, uh, Maureen is correct, we do get that question quite often, but it is seen as the most equitable distribution uh, in terms of requisition and values across the region um, when we look at how it bounces out across the region, as I said. If I may. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you so much for the for the answer, uh, similar to what I heard last year, and I'll <laughs> probably be similar to what I hear again next year. Uh, what I do want to ask, uh, however, as a, as a second question is, um, uh, are you pointing out that that Oak Bay uh, branch is extensively used, and I do notice that uh, that uh, the number of people in there, I, I, it's very impressive. Um, after um, a, re a square mode is relocated, is there any plans for relocating or expanding Oak Bay's branch? Well, <laughs> that's really a question for council. We would love it. We would absolutely love it. Um, there is a need. Absolutely, there is a need. And it is extremely heavily used. And there are lots of ideas that, that we have on how we could improve it. But it, it, is, it is something that I think you'll council, in terms of all your other priorities, mm -hmm. that's really where it lies, you know, because I would love it. <laughs> I think the, the citizens would love it too, but but you've got a lot of um, pressing priorities in this municipality. So, yeah. I just to, for those who don't know, yeah. the the way the library operating agreement works, uh, the part of that is the the formula sharing, but also it's it the municipalities are responsible for the buildings, and the operations are the responsibility of the library, and so 
Yeah, if there's new facilities, it's really up to the, munici the host municipality to determine that they want a new facility, and then the library will do the operating within that. Uh, at the, if I may finish. Uh, so thank you very much for clarifying that, both of you. And it sounds like with our asset management work going forward, we may, may want to consider that. So thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Councillor Patterson. Yes, thank you, Mayor. And thank you very much for the presentation. Um, I, I, I know that there's a lot of support for the library around this table. So uh, we just all echo uh, our thanks for the great job that um, all of the library staff does. Um, and certainly here at the Oak Bay branch, they're just great to deal with. Yeah. So thank you for that, and thank you f to Council Z Councillor Zelka, who asked a couple of my questions. But uh, one thing that is I I'm wondering about, you talked about the increasing occupancy costs, and we mm -hmm. talked a little mm -hmm. bit and had some explanation about um, the, the building. Mm -hmm. But if you could just maybe touch on oc the occupancy needs and the implementation of technology into the world of libraries. Mm -hmm. is, is the use of technology shrinking in any way, the occupancy you no. require, or is it increasing? I would say it's increasing. That's our experience right across the system. It's, it's um, you know, people are more and more needing, um, you know, a third space to, to go to, and we find that um, one of our number one um, pieces of feedback that we're getting is, could there be more space, like more diversity of space? You know, people want need quiet spaces. They want engagement spaces. They want, um, you know, study spaces, spaces for children. Um, you know, there, there's so much need. And with the technology as it is, um, it, it's actually creating more, more traffic um, in, in our branches, uh, particularly with the uh, challenges of new formats and the... Um, uh, the changes in terms of accessing things like government information, um, you know, that really requires some some um, support that staff can provide. So, yeah, I'd say we're more used than ever because of that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Braithwaite? The, the problem with going third is that usually all of your questions have been <laughs> asked. However, I'm going to touch on a couple of things. So um, I would have asked the same question as Councillor Zelka had. And then going on to the question that um, Councillor Patterson had, um, I had that question too, is, you know, the digital, how does it affect your br bricks and mortar costs? Because if you're increasing the um, amount of, because I know in your slides you said it's almost double the e-visits to the in-person visits, mm -hmm. basically. So, how number one, how does that compare to last year? And then going back on to Councillor Patterson's question, which you kind of already answered, is how does um, how does the digital affect the bricks and mortar? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So. Well, again, um, one of the things that we're finding is in terms of the bricks and mortar, um, the, the need for... Um, more flexible space to um, provide um, areas for our users to come in. Actually, you, you wouldn't think, but that just getting access to Wi-Fi, you know, is extremely important. Um, but I think that in terms of the wear and tear, uh, it's, <laughs> how can I put it, the the buildings are busier um, with a much broader range of, of use. So I think that's fair to say. Now, Paul also oversees facilities. So I don't know if you want to make a comment from that perspective or sure. pretty well. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah Maureen, to Maureen's point, that's exactly it. Um, as the role within our, within our region changes in terms of diversity, how we're serving the communities, and to Maureen's point, exactly, we are becoming that third space more than ever. Uh, so people are coming to the branches not just to take out physical materials, but they're there for the Wi-Fi, they're there for the digital services and so forth, and, and as Maureen said, you know, the flexible community meeting space. And that is placing a huge wear and tear on the facilities in terms of just traffic. And if I could just add, um, there's a book that just came out a little while ago that, that is just fantastic called Palaces for the People. And it speaks very much of the importance of spaces like public libraries to um, provide um, to to counter the sense of social isolation that so many people are experiencing, that that um, need to be with others um, is increasingly important, and we do see that um, you know in all of our branches. Uh, I think also um, families that are perhaps living in fairly. Um, you know, small living spaces, again, having that ability to come to the public library and, and you know, read story, just be, mm -hmm. which sounds a bit kind of um, simplistic, but that, that truly is our experience. Yeah. 
And I'm assuming that that book's available at your library. Yes, it is. Um, <laughs> uh, and then I do have one last yeah. question, and that is, it's going back to the um, cost per capita question, because I noticed that at least three municipalities, uh, their increase per capita went down. Mm-hmm. And now, based on the, all of the assessments from last year, I would have, I'm finding that shocking that three municipalities went down and everybody else went You're up. Out. Mm-hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Paul. Yeah, yeah, and again, the easiest way to describe that is is relative to the position of all the other municipalities. So it's not necessarily they went down; it's their position relative to other municipalities that went up. Last year, if you recall, Oak Bay, at, at, as I said, just over ten percent. Uh, this year, it was West Shore, and so again, it's positioning within the, within the region is why we see that. It was Squamalt. Uh, we were there last week. Was one of the regions that went down slightly. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Green. Yes, thank you, Baron, through you. Thank you very much for the presentation. It's good to see you again, Ms. Sawa. And um, I'm a great supporter of the library. I, I believe it's the one place where there are no prerequisites to li- literacy, which mm-hmm. is a, an absolutely important part of, mm-hmm. of our society. So it, it serves such a wonderful uh, role in literacy, in public education, and so in, in at all levels, in all ages. Um, I'm assuming that through Councillor Appleton, we will learn what some of the needs are that, or improvements that mm-hmm. need to be made at our facility, but I look forward to hearing about some of those, mm-hmm. and um, I do appreciate. We have 10 uh, municipalities involved. Yes. Are there efforts to try and um, have the other three subscribe to the, uh, to the system? I know it's a long-standing, <laughs> ongoing um, discussion, but just a question. Um, Thank you. We're always open. <laughs> I mean, again, referencing uh, the library operating agreement, um, certainly any a- a- additional municipality who is interested in, in joining the system, there is a process, and it's pretty clearly laid out. Uh, so um, you never know. No. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Councillor Appleton, I'm assuming you want to have a say a word here. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, and I, and I'm, I'm just so pleased to hear my colleagues' so, uh, support and, 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 and keen questions about uh, the library. Uh, I am, as you know, relatively new to my portfolio as being representative on the library board. Uh, so I'm still getting up to speed and, so, and very, very much to learn. Uh, I think that I would be reiterating if I uh, sort of went into depth about how valuable we know our branch is for Oak Bay. I think everybody's visited it on numerous occasions and, and understands the role that it has to play, especially it being co-located sort of with the Monterey Centre and just the, the way that people move back and forth between those two centres uh, is extremely important. So I don't think that I, that I need to sort of bring that up again. One thing that I would like to take the opportunity to mention because they probably won't mention it themselves is being fairly new to the portfolio, I've just been so struck by the professionalism and the enthusiasm and the knowledge level of the people that work for the library system. Uh, just the, the, the aura of professionalism, just the, the very, very, very professional and very organized way that everything's presented, that everything comes before the people on the library board, uh, just is, is on a different level entirely. Uh, so I, I just want to reiterate that to everybody involved so that everybody's well aware of, of you know, how the funds that go into the library board or, or into, into the library system are being used um, in, in, a, in a very, very efficient way. Uh, and the other point that I wanted to make uh, was just with regard to how uh, blown away I am by how the, the library board system is, is so far ahead of the curve technology-wise. Uh, people often will ask the question about you know, it, where is the place of the library in a modern society where you can get everything on your phone uh, and what role does that have to play? I think the folks that work for the library system have, you know, were thinking about this 10 years ago and they already have all these great resources in place at the branches, things that you wouldn't think of or, or, or normally even contemplate being part of the library system. 
Uh, and so it, there's really never been a greater role for the library in the community than there is now, even with you know the world's knowledge in your pocket on your phone. So I, I, I'm just been uh, extremely impressed with the level of technology and just the and and the knowledge level uh, at, in, implicit in the staff and and the folks who work for the branches, right down to the individual folks who are working at the desk. Uh, so I, I I've been extremely gratified to work uh, with the library board and uh, and just uh, very very impressed with everything that's gone on. So I'm I'm really pleased to hear support at the council table and uh, I'm I'm really pleased to see you in this context so thank you again for coming thank you very much thank you Councillor Appleton and, and that was a compliment of the staff not a dig at our staff I make sure that was there oh so you should maybe one of the things you could do is do the cost per capita per visit because that would drop a day's <laughs> cost significantly in that presentation yeah. uh, Councillor Appleton would you like to make a motion I will move approval of the budget. Second. Second. Moved and seconded. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed, not opposed. There you go. Well, thank you very, very much. And we really appreciate your comments and your feedback. And um, it's been great to see you. So thank you. Nice to see you too. Thank and you. and I you. also would just like to express our appreciation as we are trying to move our budget process <laughs> earlier in the year. Yeah. The fact that you were able to do your budget so early and, yeah. and have it ready uh, is very very appreciated because it'll help us as time goes on to mm -hmm. to do our budgeting in an earlier time frame as well. Yeah. So thank you for that. Well, we're glad that that worked because it was a bit of a hard year the first year we did it, yes. but now it's just easy, right? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Good night. Thank you. Thank Good night. You. All right, uh, on to item number five, uh, secondary suites infill housing options process. Uh, this is in response to a, a, a motion I guess I made last uh, thing, just asking for uh, staff to have a look at just making sure that uh, we were eyes wide open in terms of what we're doing with the secondary suites versus the housing needs versus the infill housing versus the multifamily housing kind of process. Thank you. Um, so Mr. Anderson, I think it's appropriate for me to uh, hand it over to you just to give an overview of your report I think there were some probably some questions for it but we'll just let you do a, an overview first okay thank you your worship members of council uh, as noted the uh, report before you uh, was a request of council for staff to come forward and speak to the uh, processes associated with our current secondary suite study and also the proposed infill housing options review uh, I also wanted to note that uh, some discussion of the housing needs report um, initiative is also contained within that uh, information report you have before you. Uh, I would like to outline maybe a little bit about what the secondary suites uh, study is about. It's intended to review and prepare policy and regulatory framework to consider uh, permitting secondary suites in single family homes. So that's the purpose of that study to review. Um, it's a four phase study. It's currently completing uh, the first phase background research and, and beginning preparations toward uh, public engagement session and community uh, survey in April. And uh, subsequent phases would include development of policy options and a review of, of those with the uh, uh, framework then being presented to a, a public and council session regarding the overall approach to uh, looking at secondary suites and single family homes. Um, I'll also note that that's a study and the first part of what would basically be a two-part process with respect to secondary suites. The second part would be actually looking at implementation uh, programs for new suites and for uh, an existing suite program in the community. So this is really part one of a secondary suites um, approach for the community. Uh, the report also speaks to the infill housing uh, options process. This uh, is intended to begin following the results of the uh, proposed housing needs report. So in the housing needs report, we look at obviously our housing needs and, and gaps and identify housing types um, for the community to, to consider and to consider those in the context of particularly our, our neighborhoods in Oak Bay. So as part of this report, staff have provided information on on the two processes in particular um, and, and their timing 
what we've also looked at, uh, I think in response a little bit to some of the discussion we had around our strategic initiatives was to look at possibly revising the scheduling a little bit in terms of what we had proposed um, for the infill housing options review, the housing needs report, and how that ties in, if you will, with the, the current uh, secondary st suite study that's underway. Um, so that uh, you'll find an alternative scheduling that essentially uh, on, I think it's the second page of the report, that, that speaks to bringing forward uh, a little bit the housing needs report and the, the infill housing options review as, as part of trying to sort of line those up a little bit better as they go forward. I think uh, it's important to note the secondary suites looks at suites and single family homes. The infill housing options would look at uh, uh, housing types and forms that, that would be in addition to single family suites or single family uh, housing in neighborhoods. So it would be the range from duplexes to triplexes as noted in the uh, the initiative that we brought forward. So I think uh, just to maybe clarify at the end is that, that the, uh, the housing needs uh, lead us into the suites implementation and the infill housing options review. That's basically how that sequence would play out from a staff perspective. So with that, Your Worship, I think we'd invite any comments, questions. Okay, thank you, Mr. Anderson. Uh, are there, Councillor Ney? Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, thanks to uh, Mayor Murdoch for bringing the motion forward because I found this uh, report quite useful. Uh, just a couple questions about the, um, uh, the the housing needs assessment. And um, so through you, uh, uh, Chair, to staff, um, in one of the footnotes on page two, you speak to Bill 18 and how it is that the housing needs report um, would um, you'd begin the process, but that um, you you wouldn't complete it until the regulations for Bill 18 had been fully um, uh, completed. So uh, I guess maybe the question is, when are those regs going to be completed? Because it mm -hmm. seems to have an implication for the completion of the housing needs. Mr. Anderson? Yeah, yeah through your worship. Uh, the, the province, of course, passed the, the bill that, that uh, provided for housing needs report, but then spoke to uh, the introduction of regulations that would provide a more detailed outline on what the expectations were around the housing needs report, but also would provide for, uh, our understanding is, some, some funding opportunity or some grant opportunity from them. So I think we, we speak to, we can get moving on the housing needs option report, but we certainly would like to see those regs come into play. Our understanding is it's the spring, and I, I say May when I say spring, because I think it's right in between spring and summer. So that's our expectation, is that we would see something um, from the province on regulations in that time frame. And I think that's the discussions we've had with staff at this point. Go ahead. So, I, so you can't do anything about when that comes out, but it, no. it, it, it is necessarily contingent on the commencement of the infill housing. Is that true, the completion of that needs assessment, as it looks like as you've set this up? Uh, certainly the, um, the housing needs will, will identify with some real research and, and information our housing needs. So we'll have a better picture of, if you will, what's missing or what we should be considering in terms of that. So. A couple of other questions. Yeah, please, right uh, here. Uh, through you, Mayor. S um, so the other question is, uh, when you do the housing needs report, I I'm just wondering, how do you assess the um, number of secondary suites and where they're located? H mm -hmm. How do you yeah. get that information? So the, uh, the secondary suite study will be gathering that information for us. And so we'll be getting some information on what we have for existing suites, and that can feed into the housing needs uh, report. Obviously, the housing needs will look at the continuum of, of uh, housing uh, as part of the research. It's through you, Mayor. Okay. Sorry. Um, so the question is, um, because they're not regulated now, how do we know that they exist? That was really my question. So like to do the needs assessment, mm -hmm. one of the things you want to no, to inform yeah. the, the the strategy is how many we have and where they are. Is that important to the needs assessment, or 
or so that's not part of the needs. That's it's, part of the secondary suite. Yeah, the secondary strategy. suite study will identify that information related to secondary suites, and then um, the other housing forms and types that are considered as part of the needs report right. would be gathering that information. And, and you are correct. We we don't currently permit uh, secondary suites, so we don't have official uh, records of same. But we do have sources for us to determine um, what what's out there in terms of existing suites. And certainly, uh, similarly with duplexes, where we don't currently permit duplexes, um, and, but we do know that there were numerous duplexes in the community when that uh, zoning regulation was changed. So. Okay, I'll just leave that to you. You seem to know what you're doing on that one. Good. So um, <laughs> the uh, final question I have through you, Chair, is um, you've given us two options um, as a way to do the scheduling. And on the second scheduling, option uh, it looks like the housing needs report could be bumped up by a month and uh, just a, this is kind of a minor question but it looks like the engagement if that were the case would happen at the end of December I mean is that just a picky question or is, no, is I, that yeah I think I'm not sure a, a reasonable assessment of that those are quarters just so you know not not month boxes but uh, but yeah that's that's an accurate assessment of what we're proposing as perhaps a way to make sure we, we synchronize these as best we can. Okay, and then just finally, because the request for the report had to do primarily with the relationship of the secondary suite initiative and the infill, that's what we have here. But of course, we're also looking at the zoning bylaw review. So mm -hmm. if we, we haven't got that in here because we never asked you to do that, but where would that be here as we've got it now? So the, um, uh, the the comprehensive zoning bylaw update that was discussed under strategic priorities and initiatives uh, would and is proposed to, to begin later in in our in our term I guess if in the term of the strategic plan. Um, one thing I will note is that the the housing options review and, and even the secondary suite study will lead uh, to some recommendations or or changes proposed. For the zoning bylaw, those uh, really need those studies for us to be able to, to figure out what we're going to do in terms of changing the zoning bylaw. So the zoning bylaw would benefit from from I think starting later on, so that we can take advantage of the results of our housing study. Uh, the zoning update is also quite comprehensive in in scope, and it's not, if you will, simply dealing with housing. There are a lot of updates for us to think about in terms of that. But it seemed more appropriate to get our housing uh, directions clear in terms of what we want to implement through the zoning bylaw and then roll that into our comprehensive. Thank okay. you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Nee. Councillor Braithwaite. Um, thank you, through you, Chair. Um, thanks for the report, uh, Mr. Anderson. I really appreciate it. I, I was looking at um, the costing on, I believe it's on page three, uh, and it talks about the secondary suite study being 60,000, the housing needs report 75, and the infill housing uh, options 100. And my question would be, is there a way that we can take the money, I know that we've already spent the money for the, the secondary suite study, but for the 175,000 for the other two options, or the other two um, things that we're um, going to be doing, could we perhaps hire somebody full time into the municipality on a contract basis that could perhaps do both of those items and that way perhaps saving money and maybe even saving time? Just a question. Mr. Anderson? Uh, not to be too cheap. My short answer is no, I don't think that would be uh, the best approach for the municipality. Uh, we uh, staff are more than capable to manage consultants and move processes along so having to hire additional staff uh, I'm not basically I don't know what the difference would really be between hiring a consultant to deliver a product and and contracting somebody um, it's maybe a little bit subtle in terms of the difference what you would do is you can specifically gain expertise when you go out for consultants uh, on what you need and I've found that in my past as a consultant and in my current role um, hiring consultants that uh, if you ask specifically uh, for um, a response to your needs then you can control that uh, much better as a as a staff person so anyways my opinion okay <laughs> just a, just a thought <laughs> just trying to look to save money 
Is it uh, Councillor Patterson? Yes, thank you. And thank you for the report, Mr. Anderson. Yeah. Just a follow-up to um, Councillor Braithwaite. Uh, the report, the way it's presented, it, you know, there, it's all about housing, and it is, but I, I'll follow up on Councillor Braithwaite's. And the reason in my mind that, uh, you know, we have to separate these is because we have a responsibility as a council to ensure fair and equitable taxation of the residents. And a housing plan that impacts the entire community, uh, I would expect to see it come from taxes. But user programs like secondary suites, I would expect to see come from an assessment to that user group. So even when I see the, the cost in here of the 60000 and the 75000 and we don't have anybody for here from finances, and I expect we're going to have to have a more fulsome report from them. But how those costs get allocated to the years when the work is done, and how we will actually plan to recover the amounts that are spent on secondary suites from the users of that program. Because definitely how we account for this will impact resident taxes and, you know, we do have the budget coming up this month, so I think we're going to have to have clarification on that. Um, and we're going through asset management, so we definitely know the budgets are going to be under pressure. So these are all the things that the report, while it talks about some of the process of doing it, it doesn't really talk about the, the actual application of the fees um, and some of the considerations that will be probably more prevalent with aging, housing, structure, some of those questions. So I think all of these are really going to be needed to have um, informed discussion with the community, and we're going to need that for public engagement. We're definitely going to need it as a council to come to decisions on budget. I'm not expecting the, the answers tonight, but just uh, an acknowledgement. Uh, these are very important issues affecting the programs. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Patterson. I, I think it's worth asking a question, though, which is that uh, those costs, it's a very valid question. You know, in this process of the secondary suites and the infill housing mm -hmm. uh, pieces, um, there are costs and there are, there are, you know, there are benefits uh, to, to, to housing. Are those going to form part of the reports that come back to this table to, to have a sense of what the options are in terms of how we're funding or, or charging for different services or different housing types? Yeah. I was going to say, Your Worship, um, uh, with respect to secondary suites, uh, I think without question when we look at existing suites and the program for us to, to look at regulating and, and bringing those into a position where they're recognized and legal, there's, a, there's work to be done on that. And, there, and I know from experience in previous municipality that there's, there's effort and staff resources needed to, to deliver on that product. When we think a little bit about what we're doing in general, looking at housing policy, looking at frameworks for secondary suites, um, that's really the work that municipalities do. We provide the framework for the private sector to invest in products and services that we think benefit the community. So there's an investment here in developing policy that is not one that I believe is meant to be transferred on to, to uh, the users. There are many benefiters from policy work that we do, and I think that uh, you get more specifically into uh, programs, you start to look at are there there methods that we need to recover some of the costs, but not um, in general. I just wanted to be clear from my perspective. I think policy work is is good framework work that we do in municipalities. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Green. Yes, through you, Mayor. Thank you, and thank you, Mr. Anderson, for your report. Um, just a question: When forming policy or formulating policy around secondary suites, I know that a number of communities in the region have already done this work: mm -hmm. Central Saanich, North Saanich, Saanich, <laughs> and so on. And I'm just wondering: In Victoria, are we, are we as um, uh, a municipality looking to other models nearby for some guidance, given that they've gone through sort of the you know the really difficult, challenging parts of this mm -hmm. this kind of program. They've already experienced that. Will that inform part of our formulation? Mr. Thank Anderson. You. Yes, that's that's part of the work that we're doing now, and we would do as we develop um, the framework approach. So yes. Thank you. Okay. Are there any other questions of staff at this time, Councillor Zelka? 
Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, through you uh, to staff. Uh, uh, thank you so much for your report. I very much appreciate getting uh, this perspective on uh, ways that we can maybe make some adjustments uh, to see if we can. In fact, what I was hoping for uh, was um, possibly, uh, since I think I heard you say that uh, one of the four items have been completed on the secondary suites uh, contract, and one of the items that I was imagining we might be able to consider doing is possibly, uh, I don't know whether it's possible, but I know the contract, certainly the wording of the contract seems to imply that this is possible with, with uh, I think, was it Opus? I'm trying to remember who it was with, um, that we could possibly put that on hold while we arrange to get um, uh, some of the other initiatives that were put forward in your presentation to council on, I think, the 25th or 23rd. Uh, of February. Um, so that was uh, one of the ideas that I was uh, um, uh, imagining you would be exploring in your report. Um, and uh, so I was a bit surprised when, you, when, when there was uh, this, this a, a continuing focus on moving forward with the, um, with the infill uh, aspect of it. Uh, with, uh, uh, um, uh, to, 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 my, to my opinion, not enough attention paid to um, uh, the item that's in our OCP related to uh, the where is it going again? Prepare a housing strategy. Um, uh, I know we mentioned it a lot last term, um, possibly before you were hired, mm -hmm. uh, but that was one of my biggest concerns with moving forward with the secondary suites aspect. It seemed like a cart before the horse. Now I know there's the um, housing report that we have to do to meet legislative needs, but I found I find that to be different than the housing strategy, which is really to try and to look at, at the at the bigger picture in terms of where we actually would like to have potentially secondary suites or, or other infill aspects or other mm -hmm. types of housing, um, and uh, and that's what I was hoping your report would be more speaking to uh, some aspect of how we could possibly shift things around. Um, so uh, I, I thank you for your report. Um, I'm, I'm wanting more information. Um, could we uh, maybe just phrase it as a question? Because I think it's worth asking mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Anderson of that because the that needs report is, is I think, the, in my understanding of that, maybe be a bit more than just a legislative requirement, but really is supposed to inform our all of the housing that we're looking at, really from a strategy perspective, what we actually need, literally a need in our community, mm -hmm. not just checking a box. And so can you just maybe touch base on, on that order of, of, of where that fits? Certainly, thank you. Um, one thing I will note, uh, the reference to the housing strategy and the community plan, that's uh, particularly under affordable housing and it is an affordable housing strategy specifically and it's to deal with a specific end of the housing continuum and that's what you often will see in a community plan. So it is different than I think what we're talking about in terms of this overall framework uh, that we're embarking on here and you're absolutely right, the housing needs report is basically phase one of us looking at um, a framework overall for our approach to housing. We have quite strong direction in the community plan on actions that we should take respecting delivery of a number of these housing forms in the community. I think at the strategic session, we presented that to council and, and it's, again, part of a, a housing strategy plan framework is that you figure out what you've got, figure out what you can do, decide what you want to do, look at how you're gonna do it and then deliver that. And, it, and that's basically how we think of the approach to all of this. And so doing something that is a, a, a strategy, um, basically, for example, would begin with what does the community plan tell us to do with housing? Where should we go with that? And then starting to look at uh, the opportunities and the roles that we would take in that sense, in delivering affordable housing. Um, in, in the context of a, uh, Oak Bay and where we're at with, with this, I think what we have in front of us are several initiatives that are sequenced and timed for us to be able to gain information, make decisions about where we wanna go, discuss those with the community, and then look at how we might deliver what it is we think Oak Bay needs for housing in the community. And so, of course, I think I have it well set in my mind, but I'm, I'm clearly, there's still some more discussion that we need to have about how this overall, um, approach occurs for us over the next three or four years. So. If I may, Chair, uh, thank you very much for helping to uh, form the question. I yeah. much appreciate that in terms of, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, the, obviously the, the OCP considered uh, uh, an aspect that, that that was referred to as the housing strategy. I never really considered it as simply an affordable mm -hmm. housing aspect. Um, I 
I would like to have a, a bigger picture. This, this ob obviously only provides um, a, a high-level overview. As we've seen, it's inadequate in many areas, and it really needs to be drilled down in certain areas. I, I mean, yeah. uh, uh, I think most people can agree that uh, we'll never have um, a, a, a large amount of affordable housing in Oak Bay in general, just because of, of, of the market conditions. And as we hear from, from our, uh, our assessment on the library board, um, Forty-five dollars per person in Colwood, and sixty-two dollars. Remember, get that correctly. Uh, thank, yeah, sixty something, so high sixties um, for for Oak Bay because of our assessed values that have gone uh, so much higher since the library uh, w uh, board was first struck uh, across the CRD. Um, so uh, you know, with that reality in mind, uh, that's why I I, I never uh, imagined that the uh, housing strategy would be s only restricted to to just affordable housing. Um, uh, and, and I've always uh, advocated for something that was a little more um, broad, broad based and, and willing to look at, at all of our housing uh, options across the entire district in terms of where we may or may not want, for example, secondary suites. So I appreciate uh, you basically saying that, uh, that uh, you know, uh, it sounded to me like you're saying that, that, uh, that to come up with a piecemeal approach is not really a, 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 a great aspect. You didn't exactly use those words, but that's what I sort of heard. Okay. Um, um, I, I prefer having a, a wide plan and, 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 a, and, a, and, a, and a, a really good idea as to where um, the public in general would, would feel comfortable uh, with, um, with the various different housing types before we proceed upon one in particular one. Mm -hmm. And I know previous councils have voted, um, in, uni well, not unanimously, but majority, and, um, and this council has to support previous council's decisions until we change them. So one of the things that, um, that I was hoping this report would help uh, maybe move us towards, as certainly as we're getting closer to our, our budgeting and our um, um, uh, initiatives and our priorities, is to, to decide whether we're going to possibly put that secondary suites on hold or possibly combine it with the wider um, work relating to housing in general, as opposed to focusing on just one thing. Um, so the question I have about this, is that I noticed on, on the presentation that was done, um, and I thank you so much for sending me the presentation uh, earlier on today, um, on the 23rd, was it? Yes. The 23rd, yes, where you gave a sample work plan. That sample work plan suggests that secondary suites will not finish until the end of 2022, the end of implementation. Now, does that mean, and, and you have to help me understand, because I, that, that, the way I first read that was that the bylaws would be implemented around the end of 2022. Uh, maybe aligning up with the work to be done on the zoning bylaw aspect. So I just needed to understand what was what were you anticipating because that's what I thought we were possibly getting a report on to see whether we can possibly combine some of these things that all seem to be aligning at the end of 2022. Mr. Anderson, the, can you explain that the yes. implementation period that's sort of stretched out? Yeah, yeah. And, and we are we are building a framework for housing with these processes that we have before us, but the uh, the the. The note on, on secondary suites, the study is expected to be completed this year. Implementation would then be reviewed, and that's a two-part, as I mentioned, new suites and existing suites. So new suites, it's basically looking at our zoning bylaw and, and then implementation of, of, of how we allow for new suites in single-family homes. The existing suites is, is a much um, longer uh, program in terms of how we go about uh, identifying and then bringing uh, existing suites into conformity with our our bylaws and our in our building code. So that's why that um, work plan goes on for for quite a long ways. With respect, it's primarily uh, related to the existing suites program, and, and and the new suites would be dealt with in fairly short order if uh, that was council's wish. Thank you. Can I just also I want to circle back as council Zelke, You said something that I think is fairly germane and, and it's really related to that. It took me, I had to talk to Mr. Anderson to understand the changes in that, in those charts. But, you know, I think the intention here of that, of that second option of, of moving the, the needs forward is that then it would, it would co-align the housing needs completion. So we understand what the housing needs are of the community with the end of the study phase of the secondary suites. And then we're really looking at all of the housing options to meet those needs, secondary suites, which we'd have the baseline data for, and we'd have a good sense of what we need to get more information for to, to fill in the gaps of the other housing options. And that would be that sort of the look at all the housing options together. Mm -hmm. And that's the one we need to complete this term as we have the bylaws and everything. But that's my understanding is that shift forward was allowed that essentially the co-termination of those two 
pieces. If that is Absolutely. that okay, so yes. that's so I, one of the options we have here today, and, and one I would support if someone wants to make the motion is we could move that we actually uh, approve the, the housing needs uh, in our budget now up to a maximum of say seventy five thousand dollars, which is the the cap that's in here under this, and that would allow staff to start working on it and come back with more details. But that would allow us to move that forward into this Q3, basically, of, of, of start, as opposed to waiting till after the, the uh, um, estimates process is completed. I, I think that's a good motion, and I would... We'll, we'll come back to it afterwards if we can, because okay. Councillor Zelka still has the floor. Okay. Councillor Zelka. Thank you very much, Chair. I appreciate it, being able to, sh to continue my comments uh, before we get into uh, actual motions. And, and some of those motions are, 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 are sound reasonable. I can, I can just... Uh, uh, first impressions are good. Um, uh, 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 some of, the, um, of what I've heard around, um, around moving up the housing needs report sound... Uh, like in, in terms in terms of what, what I'd be looking for would be like a bare minimum. Uh, if those housing needs report could be finished around the same time as secondary suites uh, study, uh, then I, 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 it's something that I that I think I might be able to support. Uh, I was actually imagining we could do the housing needs report first, but I understand also the regulations aren't ready yet. Um, I don't know why it's been two years, so it just seems odd. Yeah. That, uh, um, uh, so, uh, so for, for practical purposes, I, I think that might be a reasonable approach because I was hoping we could shift some money over. But, and and at, at some point, I would love to hear the, uh, the, the uh, status of any grant funding that we may have applied for in that area mm -hmm. uh, or as part of the, the feedback report that might as we come out as a result of this, um, this initiative. Um, one of the other things I wanted to comment on that I found uh, heartening is that there's an intention, and I hadn't heard this before, to focus on new secondary suites first which are way easier to get through and are way less contentious. Um, and and uh, no doubt you've, le you've learned from other districts and cities and, uh, and areas and villages across the province who have found the same thing. Um, uh, plus, you can put a very simple framework in, in place that is relatively uh, self-funding. Um, since it's relatively green field, at least, uh, at, least, at least some other districts have found that. Whereas the, the implementation of... Uh, of secondary suites for existing is uh, prone for uh, concerns in other areas, and m hopefully we won't f uh, uh, fall into the same traps that they have. Anyway, I just wanted to say thank you very much for your report, and I look forward to some of the motions coming forward. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Green, then Councillor Patterson. Yes, <clears throat> yes, thank you, and, and thank you again, Mr. Anderson. I think my concern here is uh, is the issue of managing public expectations. And we did talk a lot during the last campaign about a housing plan and how important that was and about the important of importance of public participation in that process. And I think you've identified that through the housing needs process. Um, I guess m my own concern personally is that if we don't have something done before the end of this term, um, I will be very disappointed, I have to say, because I think we have some pressing needs in the community now. Um, houses are still being demolished. Uh, new houses are being built primarily with suites. So all of this activity is going on around us, and we don't, at this point in time, have, and I, I think you've Id identified this well in the report, we don't have good policy, relevant policy, to manage that activity and to ensure that, you know, that housing needs are based or I'm sorry, that housing types are based on, on identified needs by the community. So I'm, I'm, I'm anxious, I guess, that we, we do the work sooner rather than later. I echo some of the comments of Councillors Braithwaite and Zelka on that point. But I also understand that we have limitations with um, staffing and so on and, and budgets. But I do appreciate um, Mayor Murdoch's comments about maybe bringing the housing needs study forward uh, as well. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor Green. I, I want to make a little plug here because I think it's necessary. The uh, I think what we're trying to do as a council of, of taking where we are, which has been essentially static housing zoning for decades, and and reinventing that and, and allowing for uh, you know clear guidelines for suites and duplexes and triplexes and laneway houses and 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 townhouses and, and all the other things that we may or may not in the end consider for the community to meet the needs of the community I think is pretty laudable and I, I think in the sort of the three-year time frame that we're talking about is a pretty aggressive timeline for 
for us to get through. I know I've seen beads of sweat drip down Mr. Anderson's brow at times when this discussion. So I don't, uh, I, 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 it is urgent, but it's also, I think, I think we're trying to do this as a, as a comprehensive approach so that it will have community buy-in and that is going to take a bit of time to get there. And I think that that, our job is to oversee that and make sure it happens, but I don't want to feel like, oh, it's going to be a year, that's a long time. If I look at single local area plans in, in like the city of Victoria, they often take seven or eight years, and we're trying to do this all at, in, in a fairly short period of time. So I think, I think we are being quite, quite speedy within the realms of, 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 of caution. Sorry, uh, that was my rant for the, for the moment. <laughs> Councillor Patterson. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, just um, be, from some of the re remarks around the council table here, I am uh, curious to learn what, if anything, we are doing um, with with all of the construction we're doing, and, and certainly the planning department has has been um, advising us of all of the activity that's taking place. So I'm wondering uh, what we are doing currently or have been doing hopefully for a while to capture information uh, on changes that are taking place in the community now we see new homes going up that quite obviously are being built out for accommodation on a lower level or upper level wh whatever but they are being built out with um, facilities that would would provide for um, uh, multiple occupancy in a building. So how are we capturing that data? Are we capturing the data? Will it feed into the plan? Uh, so just if we uh, could have some information on that, it would be appreciated. Okay, thank you. I don't know if that's a question or just a comment. I think it's a reasonable comment. It, Mr. Anderson, do you, do you have an answer? Or well, well if, if I may, Your Worship, we, we certainly, through our building permits, have all of that information all those records and and um, I think that's probably as much as I can say on that but okay thank you okay I, there's a couple of I mean the, the primary th motion here is just to receive the report but if there's any ancillary motions we might take those as well uh, Councillor Braithwaite so I think that you were talking about a motion that perhaps would put seventy five thousand dollars into the budget to start the housing needs um, reports sooner then what was yes why don't we do planned? this in, in comes uh, mr anderson if i may just uh, uh i think fifty thousand would work the 75 is is, is based on grant. whether or not we get the grant okay, so, okay. <laughs> do i hear 25. Yeah. <laughs> so a little auction here to get it every time um uh, so uh, yes yeah, so just just for clarification my understanding of talking with uh Ms. hopkins earlier is that there's a uh, well, first of all, we have a we need to receive the report, so that's one motion. Uh, a secondary motion, if we do want to move this forward, uh, it just has to be a financial uh, piece because the staff can go ahead and do the work, but they can't do anything unless there's a financial approval. So it would essentially be just for council to give early approval to up to fifty thousand dollars to start the housing needs report, and that would authorize staff to start the process. So, oh. so I'll move receipt of the report. Second. Moved and seconded. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Opposed? None opposed? And then I'll make a mo motion to put $50,000 um, into early approval to start the housing needs report. Second. second. Moved and seconded. Any other discussion? Just to ensure the name. clarification um, uh, through you, Chair, to staff. So what that would mean then with that motion is that we would be looking at the second scheduling option not the first is that is that what we're doing on the on the that report that is correct okay thank you all right uh, councillor appleton just very quickly and i apologize for being dense here but i i'm going to assume i'm going to pose a question to staff uh through you your worship that I, i'm assuming that staff proposed the alternative scheduling with the idea that this was reasonable and 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 doable with staff resources in the time frame allotted that this wasn't uh, otherwise being excessively taxing on on staff time that this was doable within their work plan uh, Mr. With, with limited sweat on my brow yes <laughs> Thank you. Good question. Yes, uh, Councillor Patterson. Yes, thank you. Uh, just as a follow-up to the motion, 
uh, just for clarification, the uh, 50000 that's proposed to be um, directed to the housing needs report then, um, is the motion to take it to budget as opposed to approve it now without the inform in consent of the whole budget? So the motion is to approve it now, not to take it to estimates. Uh, the and just for clarification of what that would look like, it it shifts it earlier this year than it would be later, according to the to the work plan that we've talked about so far. It doesn't change the budget. The other option to that would for it not to be approved in this year's budget and then start in, tw in the twenty twenty uh, budget. So I think the question would really be, if the comfort is that we're going to start it this year, then this doesn't has any uh, have any impact. If the feeling is that we want to, cons I, I, that's just the shift. Right? It's not, it's not a shift in or out of the budget. It's a shift if we feel comfortable with it in this, in this session. Councillor Zelka. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, so it, it, I, I would be uh, willing to support um, a 50K early approval uh, for a housing needs report. Um, I'm assuming that staff will still be applying for the grant uh, that's available through, I believe, UCBM. Uh, to assist with this uh, with this report process, uh, which uh, um, may may reduce the fifty or may will, will may increase it, we don't know. But uh, but no more from tax in terms of tax money, no more than fifty, of course. And um, and it sounds like at the end of this year, when the secondary suites report um, uh, completes, approximately the same times as the housing needs reports, we'll have a chance in our next budgeting cycle, the next priority cycle to review with more information available and uh, basically take stock at that point. I just, uh, that's, that, that is my that, understanding, that, Mr. That Anderson. Rhetorical I, I'll, question I'm going to look to you just to make sure that's, that's a reasonable expectation. Uh, yes, it is. So the last thing is um, with, that, with, with that assumption that we're not actually approving anything to go forward, but we will have a chance to revisit it at the end of the year with that information in mind. So we're not actually ag approving secondary suites. We're not approving any, anything in the housing needs report. We're simply approving the end of the study. Oh, sorry, the, 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 the two studies will finish at the approximately the same time. Of course, with um, input from the public. Correct. It's, yes. I know you know that, but I appreciate you clarifying it for those sitting around the audience or at home. Okay, fair enough. Uh, any other discussion? Okay, seeing I'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? None opposed? Thank you, everyone. That's great. And uh, I think that concludes, unless there's any other. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, we are moving on to item number six, which is the uh, advisory design panel minutes. Move receipt of the minutes. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Councillor Zelka. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I have a question about the uh, minutes related to item number four for 3395 Wheeled Road. Uh, if you recall, there was some uh, quite a fair, fair bit of discussion around the council table uh, and uh, about this property. Um, and uh, we had a report from staff that summarized some of these, these comments. So I have a question. Um, I, I, I compared the report with these comments, and I couldn't exactly jibe them. So I need to help have some uh, some help understanding what these comments are saying to me. Number one, and number two, with the summary, um, how possibly we could improve it in the future. Um, maybe just some suggestions. But it seems to me, and please, I'd like to con to clarify uh, through you uh, with staff that um, in these comments that came back on. Uh, you know, the, it, uh, for this particular uh, uh, property, uh, the person was refer returning the second time with changes to, to, to their plans, and the panel had additional comments with additional changes that are in some ways captured in the checklist. You know, for example, um, more substantial vegetative screen can be developed. Um, uh, the house conforms, but concerns about setback. Um, it's important that the stone elements be, uh, you know, a, 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 um, that the that the lintels reflect uh, a load bearing function, even though they aren't load bearing. I mean, th there's there's all these all these advice buried in the comments in there. You know, to 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 to, to my way of thinking implies that they weren't quite satisfied, and that uh, is, is my read, and yet uh, being an advisory panel, they can't exactly tell owners what to do. Um, so uh, I do see at the end that there was a moving and a seconding to, 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 uh, to move forward, but the question is, and this does not tell me, that second load of advice that was given to the owner 
was any of it taken up? I can't tell from these minutes. Thank you. Um, Mr. Anderson? Yeah, maybe I can speak generally to what occurs at a design panel meeting in a process like this, and then that may um, help in understanding how we ended up where we were at with respect to the report. But uh, th this item uh, did go to two advisory design panel meetings, so that's one point to make that's not typical. Um, the other point to make, I think, is that the panel um, has a discussion, makes comments, comes to a point where they consider a recommendation. Let's assume we're at the second meeting now of the ADP. Um, and what they do is they make a recommendation on whether or not to support um, the application, but they also will provide comments uh, for consideration as this goes forward to council. So there's a difference between the comments that come out of the meeting associated with a report from staff to council versus comments they make throughout the meeting. So uh, just to make that distinction, so there ends up being basically a, a summary and agreement by the design panel of those comments that are going to be attached to the recommendation. So staff review those with the applicant and then uh, bring a report forward that, that says these were addressed, these are not addressed, this is the approach the applicants would like to take. So that's our typical process when we have comments that accompany a recommendation from the panel. We don't always get comments coming out of a panel meeting. We could just get a recommendation. So hopefully that helps a little bit. And, and you might find that there is that um, more said at the meetings that, that get, then gets moved forward into the comments that then come forward to council. So I hope that helps. We should probably do this a few times for us to get really clear on <laughs> how this goes but uh, yeah. and I think this is a good one for us that like, we're doing a review of our, our committees and commissions to get this how this comes forward but uh, uh, last comment if I may uh, before I, uh, I, I, I agree to uh, to move forward on this um, the uh, uh, in the report and and and, and even in, in these minutes um, I still can't tell um, whether um, the moving and seconding and the motion was carried was based on the second set of comments about what they'd like to see changed, or it was based on here's the comments we're going to give you, and whether you do it or not, um, it, it 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 kind of meets or doesn't meet. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd like I'd, I'd, what's important to me about this particular um, area of Oak Bay is that it's the uplands. So um, and and this particular committee has been charged uh, under the Oak Bay Special Powers Act with very specific um, uh, laws and duties and responsibilities. So their advice on an uplands property, I give much greater weight to than if it was a non-uplands property, with respect to um, you know look and feel and and and, and fit in with the with the with the uh, heritage aspect and the and the and the and, and and the whole aspect about the specialness of the, of that um, a residential park of of the um, of the uh, um, of of the original designer. So. Um, um, when I see major concerns, you know, in, uh, for example, on the landscaping, and I see, you know, um, uh, just concerns about a, a, a fair, fairly number of concerns related in the, in this, in, in, for example, it need to increase, increase setback relationship to adjacent other buildings. Um, I wasn't sure whether that was approved or not. So how can I, or how will we be able to tell maybe in the future, uh, or maybe this is part of our design work, how will we be able to tell in the future what advice was left on the, f on the table and not taken up and what advice was actually implemented? Because uh, yeah, I, I would, I need to know that. So the, I think this is to you, Mr. Anderson, uh, is in that piece. And I think that the, the question here, and you can interpret as you see fit, was is also is clarification of what is uh, at what point does this move forward with recommendations for additional work to be done, or is a recommendation considered to be a recommendation for approval as it, as it is? Yeah. So. so uh, Maybe to go back a little bit to, to, to what I said, the, the, the panel can uh, make a recommendation to council. Uh, they can make a recommendation with uh, comments that they would like uh, considered prior to this moving forward to council. And that's a matter that staff then review with the applicant prior to us putting a report together for council. So that's, those are the two processes. So what comes out of a panel is the result of the discussion and the agreement that the panel has on the form of recommendation they're making. 
uh, I, I don't know if I can say much more to that. It's There is a culmination of, of that discussion and, and there's a recording of, of, of all the comments in the minutes. But it, when it comes down to the comments that are added to a recommendation, those are agreed upon by the panel when they finish their deliberations and staff then take that forward. Hope that helps. Thanks. Councillor Patterson. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and I, th I think the question that Councillor Zelka uh, raised was, was very good. And this is something that we can probably, when we're looking at the review of the committees and commissions, consider. But um, some municipalities, they have something like this checklist. Uh, and, but what it will also, there'll be another column on it that will um, will identify commitments or or changes that have been acted upon. And so, therefore, when you read through the list, um, sometimes you know the applicant isn't willing to change everything, but maybe they've gone eighty or ninety percent of the way there. And and I think sometimes having that information. Um, guides the decision by councils or other bodies because they can see how much movement has occurred and, and how much, much flexibility has been there to move an application forward. So I think that that's something perhaps we can consider um, when we're looking at the review of committees and commissions. Thanks, Councillor. If, if I may, Your Worship. Uh, Mr. Anderson. Um, we do that. So you'll see that in the reports. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to clarify that because we do that. Okay, thank you. We have a motion to receive on the table. Any other discussion? All those in favor? Opposed? Then opposed. Thank you very much. Uh, next Heritage Commission minutes. Move, move receipt. Second. second. Moved and seconded. Uh, any other any discussion on the Heritage minutes? Seeing none, we'll call the question. All those in favor? Opposed? Then opposed. Thank you. Uh, new business reports by the committees. So um, any new business? This is uh, any motions, notices of motions, things of that nature. Okay, uh, report on the Capital Regional District. Uh, I did have the uh, enjoyment, I guess, of going to the uh, 911 opening of the new 911 building, which is the CRD uh, built building and uh, very impressive. Uh, and again, attended by many people, including the province who didn't fund it, uh, but they always they were there anyway. And the governance and the, f uh, I was also, uh, we've had one governance and finance committee meeting, um, which didn't have anything of significance at it. Uh, mostly things sent back to staff for clarification and for changes. Um, but there is a CRD meeting coming up on Wednesday and I'll have an update on that meeting when I come back to the next council meeting. Uh, other, other verbal reports? Council, I'll, we'll just go around if that's okay. Councilor Zelka. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair, and uh, and thank you for sending me um, as your stead, uh, as the acting mayor this uh, this month, to the uh, grand opening of the Chinese Community Services Center that I attended on March 9th. Instead of unfortunately, uh, um, instead of going to the uh, to, to Chief Cockle's uh, um, uh, beer beer fest, no, I, excuse me, a retirement party. Um, but the Chinese Community uh, Services Center was absolutely excellent, and um, not only was the uh, mayor of uh, Victoria there, but also uh, the um, Minister of Education, um, Rob Fleming, and the uh, Victoria Chief of Police. Um, uh, we were uh, feted with, uh, with uh, some wonderful food and a dragon dance, and of course, uh, um, uh, the, fire, the, 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 the traditional uh, fireworks um, and, uh, and fire, firecrackers. So um, they were very pleased that Oak Bay sent a representative um, because of our, of our Oak Bay um, Chinese Cemetery uh, and, and the, uh, the, the trust that we hold on, on, their, on the behalf of the Benevolent Society there. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Patterson, anything? Nothing new to report. Okay, thank you. Councillor Ney? Yeah, I, so I'd just like to thank, um, uh, I guess, uh, Councillor Patterson and uh, Mayor Murdoch for attending the Ideas Fast Solutions for Our Planet that we had up at University of Victoria, sponsored through the um, School of Public Administration at the Faculty of Human Social Development. It was great to... Uh, it was a networking opportunity for community members with researchers working on climate change initiatives, and um, there were some good um, good discussions. And I know uh, Mayor Murdoch, they sent you back some nice links um, that we were able to spread out about some of the works that they're doing that may be relevant for local government to use sort of um, carbon footprint reduction on the housing 
development strategy. So thank you to both of you for coming out. It was good that people gave me feedback. It was nice to see local politicians. There were a number of community members and politicians from Saanich as well. So it was a good mingling. So thanks a lot. Thank you, Councilor. And thanks for the invitation. Uh, it was really good. There were some very, very interesting ideas of other jurisdictions and how they've been tackling some of the, uh, the carbon footprint outside of our direct uh, controls, but in, in, in some of the housing and other aspects. Councilor Green? Nothing really new other than to let everyone know that the um, OP Tourism Committee meeting that was scheduled for last week has been postponed to March the 21st, and the Greater Victoria Labor Relations Association meeting was cancelled this month and will reconvene in April. Councilor Braithwaite? Uh, I basically was going to say um, thank you to the Oak Bay Fire Department for hosting the fire um, chiefs or the retired fire chiefs um, retirement um, and, and how great it was to see uh, the four or the I guess there was four altogether chiefs or past chiefs at the event and um, I took a picture and uh, it showed 117.5 years of service between the four of them and I thought that was pretty awesome. But the uh, the rec fund um, or the recreation committee uh, for the fire department put on a great event so I think uh, kudos to them for doing that. And then just a reminder to everyone that AVICC is coming up on April 11th and I think everyone is going, are they? Oh. Councillor Patterson, you're not. Sad. We'll miss you. Can we still borrow your van? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> this is not the appropriate table to discuss that, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Councillor Appleton. <laughs> Thank you, Worship. Uh, a couple of items just over this last past month. Uh, I did attend uh, just at the end of last month the library board's annual, or sorry, monthly meeting, as well as the inaugural meeting of the library board's uh, planning and policy committee, subcommittee of the board, uh, which I'm serving on. Uh, and in response to Councillor Green's uh, request for, for updates on information, I think we're sort of getting up and into the, the meat of things now with the new library board, so certainly we'll be reporting back on that. But uh, will be there there are some large things as which are fresh in people's minds because they were just presented tonight the facilities plan is a big thing uh renewing sort of the strategic direction documents and uh, looking at uh there is a facilities plan underway and looking at options for a new main branch is is on very much on people's minds so that's that's really uh, some of the big topics for the library board at this point uh also this weekend, I was pleased to attend, as well as Councillor Nay, uh, the Community Association of Oak Bay's uh, presentation on plastic waste, uh, which was well attended and uh, and excellent. The uh, the young folks who came to speak to us at Council uh, about uh, plastic waste issues also uh, were present there uh, and and spoke and uh, were some very very good dialogue and some good uh, uh, well informative and very relevant. I was pleased to be able to pass along on behalf of Councillor Nay that uh, we do have this resolution coming before Council tonight dealing with single-use plastics amongst other disposables uh, and uh, I, I think there was this was this was well received for sure uh, and then just finally yesterday I was uh, pleased to go on a bicycle ride in very nice weather with uh, Her Excellency the Governor-General uh, downtown uh, who's promoting her uh, GG Active. She has a, a, a program to encourage physical fitness and activity, physical activity, so this was in aid of support of that, uh, and also promoting the work of the Greater Victoria Bike to Work Society. Uh, who partners with Oak Bay, as you know, during Bike to Work Week every year. So I was pleased to go out and represent Oak Bay there and uh, and support the work of, of the Bike to Work Society because they uh, do yeoman's work getting people engaged in, in that project. So I uh, had a, a brief chance to, to chat with Her Excellency, and uh, she demonstrated skills in bicycle repair. Somebody's bike broke, and she uh, she actually was she was actively involved in repa repairing it out on the tram. So, yeah, so it was, uh, yeah. It was, a, it was a really great event in great weather, and uh, it was a pleasure to be there. Excellent. Good use of the engineering degree. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I actually, that reminded me, one of the comments was I also had the uh, pleasure of attending the uh, the Victoria Destination Greater Victoria um, uh, Business Plan uh, Review. So they released their business plan and summary of past year. And it's just nice to see 
uh, a couple of things uh, from uh, from Oak Bay's perspective. One was the engagement on things like the um, the, the sports tourism uh, and, and our piece there, um, but also directly uh, Oak Bay Beach Hotel is now an, an ancillary member of that as well and funds for regional. So there's a, a closer alliance on the conferences and other aspects uh, of Oak Bay tourism with that. And they acknowledge the, the partnership of Oak Bay tourism uh, as part of their business plan. So it was good, good to see that regional cooperation on that front as well. Okay. All right, that's verbal reports. Moving on to item number nine. Good timing there on their last piece, Councillor Appleton, on the uh, resolution for single-use item reduction strategy. Uh, Councillor Nay, this is uh, your resolution. I hand it over to you okay. to uh, to make the motion, I guess, and then to uh, and then to motivate. Okay. So um, yeah. So the motion is uh, that uh, there is a number of uh, warehouses, but I'll just go straight to the motion that Council referred to. Strategic priorities for council consideration that staff be given direction to investigate and report back on regulatory and engagement options to address the distribution, use, and recycling of common disposed items designed for single use, including plastic shopping bags, coffee cups, expanded polystyrene fast food packaging, and provide potential options for exploring ideas to restrict or ban the use of these products. Second. So, moved and seconded. Is there to want to just talk to it uh, yeah. briefly? So, um, first of all, thanks for s to staff for helping to pull the uh, motion together. And um, the, the motion was essentially prompted by the presentation by the GNS students, we'll recall, a, f uh, a number of weeks ago. Um, who reminded us that the use of plastics is ubiquitous and that the plastics are harming uh, the environment in some significant way. And they showed us, uh, you know, pictures and gave us statistics and done their research. And, of course, in the community, as uh, Andrew, uh, Councillor Appleton has brought to our attention, uh, the Community Association, along with these students, have made a presentation to the public. And, and um, indeed, there is... Um, a receptivity to not only receptivity but um, sort of advocacy by the community to for us to do something. So um, the the idea here is um, I, I like this notion of um, to to shift from a take make waste uh, model of uh, plastics uh, to to um, what they typically are calling um, a, a circular economy for uh, um, uh, plastics where we're really um, reducing, reusing, and recycling uh, the plastics. So um, the motion as is presented is rather wide sweeping, uh, but I, I, that was done quite deliberately because the idea of bringing a larger lens to um, these issues uh, seems to take into account that we're really working overall to a zero waste reduction. Uh, but I'm, I'm under no illusion that it's unlikely uh, that we're going to uh, embark on this larger strategy. We don't have either the resources or probably we're not going to put the money to that. And further, for a smaller community like Oak Bay, um, there's, uh, there's, it, it's a much easier kind of uh, initiative to move forward than a larger city like Vancouver. So, so if if we can get this motion over to the strategic priorities, um, I would be, uh, you know, working towards advocating that we work towards one initiative, uh, probably the reduction of single-use shopping bags, because that would put us in alignment with what Victoria Sanich and now Esquimalt is moving in that direction. So it's a really a low-hanging fruit for us here in Oak Bay because um, it, you've probably seen the, 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 the businesses are already doing it at Fairways. They're charging 15 cents for a shopping bag. Um, I noticed over at the Willows Galley, they've shifted all the way. F they're using recyclable kinds of... Um, uh, containers that got rid of styrofoam. So I, it, it's already on its way. So the, the, the market is evolving. Um, and uh, uh, I, I don't think we're going to do any revolution here, but we can sort of pick up on the momentum of where it's going. So, um, so really the motion is looking to move this to strategic priority so we can have the discussion there about what specifically we'd like, if anything at all, uh, to ask staff to move forward. 
Thank you. Are there any comments or discussion? Yes, Councillor Green. Just comments. Um, thank you, Your Worship. Um, and first of all, I really, you know, I support the spirit of this re resolution, absolutely. Only just four things that I, I was thinking about as you were speaking and as, as I was looking at the resolution earlier. What can we do as a municipality? That's the first thing. What is a realistic option for us on this front? Um, the wider recycling process that I hope to see, the blue box process across the municipality, um, I would hope that that would still have momentum, re regardless of what we do with this resolution. Um, I also think this would be an ideal initiative for a three-person uh, in mayor's environmental task force, perhaps, to to look at, to take some of the load off staff, um, because we do have a number of strategic priorities now on the list, and this is my worry that we that we get too many and then we don't get to any, so that that's just that. And then also the, the need for the Business Improvement Association input, only because our local businesses, um, I think, should be heard on this issue, and I'm sure that they will be I, I won't speak for them, but I'm, I'm sure there will be some support. But I, I just want to make sure that we're not uh, rushing to judgment on their behalf, and that you know they have time to think about this, and then and then come up with their own implementation process. So those are my four concerns or points. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comment points? Okay. Thank you. I, I just I'll just reiterate. I think I appreciate the comprehensive report. I think that's where we have to get to. I. I, I'm sort of also at echo Councillor Greens. I think there's there's parts to this. I think the, in fact, I was looking at this going, why don't we just move forward with the bag piece? But we can do that at strategic planning. So that's that's certainly, and I appreciate you you raising that as an obvious piece because we should be, if we're going to do that, now is the time with alignment with Sanders bring it bringing it in at the end of the year. Uh, but also, uh, we need a way to capture these materials back again. So I think we do have to consider the that broader question of how do we make it possible for people on the street to recycle and compose and, and other aspects. So thank you very much for bringing this forward. Uh, we have a motion on the table, seconded. Any other discussion? Call the question, all those in favor? Opposed, not opposed, thank you very much. Uh, and with that, we're gonna have a resolution to move uh, in camera. I move that in accordance with section 91B of the community charter that the open portion of the meeting of council be adjourned and that a closed session be convened to discuss personal information about an identifiable individual who has been considered for a municipal award or honor or who has been offered to provide a gift to the municipality on condition of anonymity. Second. Move seconded, all those in favor? Opposed, not opposed. Thank you very much, everyone.